a wolf that went to sleep in the Arctic Circle and woke up on the rooftop of a Manhattan skyscraper. I wonder if community is still a source of hope. Community is one of our obsessions. We all long to belong to a larger we because we are obsessed precisely with what we lack. But you know, locos and locas, communities of sameness drive me up the wall. Conjure my asthma, give me acute vertigo. My community is not confined by ideological, national, or ethnic boundaries. Mine is a community of difference, and therefore it is fragmented, ever-changing, and temporary. My America is brown, black, yellow, red, pink, green. And that's how I like it. Besides, no one belongs to only one community, not even the Christian right. Not even my chihuahua, Siegfried Ne Babalu. <laughs> he hangs out with rodents, marsupials, and ghosts. <laughs> like Babalus, my peers are scattered all over the pinche planet, howling outsiders jumping all over the planet. Some of you are my peers. Others are total strangers in my community of strangers. I long for my peers every night. And hopefully, you long for me as well. And every now and then, like this week, here, invited by Beth and her colleagues, like this week, when we get together, we lick each other's wounds and dance until the morning after, like rabid kangaroos, like rebel cyborgs, and then we fall asleep and we dream of a better present. In this imaginary place we dream about, artists and writers are actually needed and taken care of. We have universal medical insurance, a decent low rider car, <laughs> a great studio space in the bohemian hood of your choice, and we get paid decently for what we do. We make important decisions and fix concrete problems for society. In this imaginary place we dream about, schools, hospitals, even airports are reconceptualized and decorated by artists. The daily papers are written by philosophers, novelists, and poets. We have ongoing access to electronic media where we make people think, remember, imagine, and laugh. We collaborate with lawyers, doctors, priests, scientists in the great project of co-imagining a better future for the borderless community of humankind. Sounds so pinche corny, but so appealing, que no? In this imaginary place, there is a place for everyone. Almost everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we have Suzanne Cockrell and Ted Purvis for a slight shift in tone. <laughs> Hello, Santa Cruz. Hello. <laughs> it is a total honor to be here on this panel and uh, this event and conversation. I'm Suzanne Cockrell and Ted Purvis, my husband. Our projects begin usually with questions, and they evolve into conversations between ourselves, between our friends and colleagues, between our neighbors, and other communities that we might not know so well.
usually addressing things we care about, things we don't quite understand, things we want to understand better, things that we worry about. How do customs or symbols that are stereotypically rural migrate to an urban setting? Do they facilitate similar cultural changes in their new context? Similarly, how do systems of art and cultural production overlay and amplify local experience and traditions? Temescal, what? Okay. Working out the timing here. Temescal Amity Works was a long-term project. It began in July 2004, and was, uh, we closed the storefront door in January 2007, and it was sited in the Temescal neighborhood of Oakland, California, where we live. We maintained a storefront, a website, and coordinated the Big Backyard, a crop-sharing initiative that was building on our neighborhood's history as an Italian-American community planted with citrus and fruit trees by its original immigrant families. We collected surplus fruits and vegetables from neighborhood yards with a hand-built steel push cart. And during its two and a half years of production, Temis Calamity Works harvested, harvested thousands of oranges, lemons, apples, figs, plums, and other produce from local yards and was redistributed that, to those people free. We made and gave away marmalade, fig, fig conserve, and apple butter. And in addition, we sponsored short artists in residencies, hosted neighborhood walks and film screenings, and produced free publications, including a series of postcards and a neighborhood resource map. We're going to trade off. In retrospect, we now consider Amity Works as a social sculpture that drew on models such as mutual aid societies, barn raisings, DIY collectives, and urban communism. We were interested in how a specific community built relationships through personal and casual economies. The project focused community awareness onto issues of neighborhood microeconomies, sustainability, cooperative sociality, local history, ecology. By creating new visual circumstances, a push cart, a neighborhood walk, a map, a collective marmalade, to describe these issues, the project offered a space, both physical and virtual, where such issues should be, could be considered alongside their more global manifestations. And in this way, Temescal Amity work reframed local social economies as both symbols and manifestations of complex urban possibilities. My mother, Joyce, grew up on a farm in rural Michigan. Every summer, we were packed into a Dodge Dart station wagon to make a two-day trip back to see her family. And our family vacation was an annual migration to the land of wheat and corn and cousins and silos, tall silos full of corn and trains. She and all of her sisters and brothers continued to implement their family tradition wherever they moved, whether they lived on farms or in towns or suburbs. They kept gardens, they picked fruit, they preserved food and drew on each other as resources. They passed on knowledge of these traditions through direct observation, ritual and habit. Family and landscape became mythic. They were central factors for how people came together. And storytelling as a product of memory and a way of connecting to history became a social form that is still deeply rooted in me. In the 70s, my father developed a community garden program in Job Bank in a small town where we were living in Vermont. A wealthy patron had donated a piece of land to the garden project. Mostly renters and low-income families came to stake out plots and garden the rich soil on the banks of the Atacuichi River during the summer. And in response, he received a series of letters from local residents claiming he was a communist and the gardens a disruption to the social life of the village. We were invited to take place in an exhibition called Hybrid Fields at the Sonoma County Museum. For this show, we created a piece called Sonoma County Preserve, an exhibition of a wide variety of home preserved foods made by residents of Sonoma County, ranging from jams and pickles to vinegars. The project presented foods that people had grown and foraged for, food that they'd preserved for future use or for gift giving. Sonoma County Preserve culminated in a day-long opening, an event where each of the entries was opened and tasted by both museum visitors and a panel of judges.